morning. My favorite Sunday of the entire year. If you know, you know. Especially the early service this morning. That was a fun one. So <laughs> we actually uh, played a little game with the worship team before the early service at 8 a.m. We wrote on the board how many people we guessed I could spot sleeping during my sermon at the early service. And um, I only spotted two last service. Because if you're new here, here here's, God has given me this weird spiritual gift. I don't know what it is. But um, I can always spot when people are sleeping while I'm preaching. It's the weird. I think God does that to keep me humble. Um, and listen, I'm, I will never shame you or make you feel bad if you feel comfortable enough in the presence of the Lord to go to sleep in the arms of your father. <laughs> However, if you have the audacity to tell me how good of a sermon it was I preached to you when I know for a fact you were sleeping the most of it, that's between you and God, not me, right? So I'm glad you're here this morning. If you have a Bible, I hope you do. We are in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3 this morning. Galatians is a letter in the New Testament from the Apostle Paul to believers in a region called Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey. And this church was apparently planted by Paul, and it was planted on the truth of the gospel. And these Christians started their walk with Jesus through faith in Christ. That is, until some false teachers showed up and said to these Christians, you know, that guy Paul, he said that to be made right with God, it's faith in Christ. But we're here to tell you, he was wrong. It's not faith in Christ. It's faith in Christ plus observing the Jewish law. It's faith in Christ plus works like circumcision. And so Paul, all throughout this letter, has said, no, 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 no. It is faith in Christ that saves, that justifies, that makes us right with God. So in chapter 2, where we were last week, we see that Paul is... Um, really vouching for his own credibility and authority within the early church. He's talking about how he is in partnership with the church in Jerusalem. They're not on different teams. They're on the same team. And Paul makes it very clear that the life of faith is what this is all about. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. It is now Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live according to the power of Christ who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so Paul's going to continue in chapter 3, further explaining how salvation, being made right with God, being justified, that comes through faith. And he's going to speak to some of these people in the church who were all about preserving the purity of the Jewish religion because they were appealing to the law, they were appealing to Moses. And Paul says, okay, if we're going to talk about the purity of the Jewish faith, let's go back to the father of the Jewish faith. You know him, Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham. And he says, okay, let's talk about Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith. How was Abraham made right with God? Was it through obeying the law? Well, actually, the scripture says he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so then we see all these interesting verses in the Old Testament about the seed of Abraham and Abraham's family and the great multitude of people being made into the family of Abraham, like, how does all that work? And what Paul's going to say is, listen, this is all about saying yes and amen and believing the promises of God. This is all about faith. And if we have faith in God and his promises and the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus, then we're part of the same family, that we're united as children of God through faith. Listen, if that is true, that is the most inclusive unifying, revolutionary message on planet Earth. How many of you know that we live in an exceptionally divided culture right now? And man, what what we're looking for, I think what we're aching for is is just to belong. I think this is why we're obsessed with labels. Do you notice this? We have political labels, ethnic labels, gender labels, ideological labels. We all try to figure out who that person is looking across from us based on the label that they've been assigned, based on the label that we are. And what the gospel says is the gospel of Jesus Christ shatters all your labels because it says, first and foremost, you are identified by who you are in Christ. And so that's what unifies. And that's the good news. This is an actual selfie of Abraham I lifted from his Instagram. (laughs) Just seeing if you're awake this morning. Hey, let's pray, then we'll jump into the text together. Father God, we need you. We thank you that um, the gospel is good news. 
We thank you for the freedom and we thank you for the blessing of Abraham that we can be made right with you, not because of our ability to keep the law, because Lord, none of us can keep the law. That we can be made right with you simply because we look at the promises that you've made to us and we say yes and amen. And we receive them through faith. So today I pray that whatever baggage that we come to this text with, whatever legalism we might have brought into this room, that Lord, the truth of what your word says would shatter through all of that. And we would see you today and we would respond in the way that you've called us to respond. Lord, we're going to read this morning that we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, we choose to believe that. And so because of that, we want to pray for every church in Cannon County, Tennessee, that if they're preaching and proclaiming this gospel, they are part of our family. And we want to pray for them. We want to ask that you would bless every church in our community and help us, Lord, to live out what your word says that we are. We are one in Christ Jesus and help us to be one, we pray. Be with us now as we read and study your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if you will, at verse 1, chapter 3. We'll read from verse 1 to verse 9. You foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? <clears throat> Did you experience so much for nothing? If in fact it was for nothing. So then does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law? Or is it by believing what you heard? Just like Abraham who believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. You know then that those who have faith, these are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and proclaim the gospel ahead of time to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed through you. Consequently, those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Paul says to these believers, you guys are being foolish he says, who's cast a spell on you? Who's bewitched you? Uh, to Paul, this isn't him insulting them. This is kind of a fatherly rebuke, an admonition to them. <clears throat> they started their faith and walk with Jesus so well, but then they started to drift away from that. And Paul says, it's like somebody cast a spell over you. It's like you've been bewitched. It's like you're not able to think or act according to reason or the truth that you've been taught. That Paul's preaching of the gospel to them was so vivid. It was so full of power. He says it was like Jesus Christ was publicly crucified before your very eyes. That you know the gospel, you know the truth, but it's like somebody's cast a spell on you. Uh, my wife and I have this very weird hobby <coughs> of watching documentaries about cults. Anybody else have that hobby? <laughs> oh, there's a lot of good ones out there. And one of the things that fascinates us as we're watching about some of these groups is we'll watch it and we'll just say, how can anybody fall for this? Anybody have that same thought as you watch some of this? And the more that I've studied cult groups and the more I've kind of thought about it, um, the more I've seen that there are some spiritual, religious, legalistic movements that can be quite bewitching. That can cause people to lose their ability to really reasonably think about how they practice their faith. And I would say that that is quite foolish. Um, and I think that's because fear is a powerful thing. And shame is a powerful thing, right? And so a group that shows up and tries to manipulate and control someone using fear and shame, that can cast a spell on someone, as it were, into them never really considering with, with what they're being told or taught or believing actually lines up with the truth of Scripture. And they think, I, I'm not allowed to question this because if I do, somebody will tell me that I'm not a true believer, I don't really want to be spiritual, or I'm a lawbreaker, or what it is. And so that fear and shame kind of keeps them from asking those questions and thinking about it. It's like someone's had a spell cast over them. I also think that um, the desire to be spiritually superior is also quite intoxicating. That that can kind of bewitch a person into being part of a tribe 
or a group that is caught up in legalism, that is caught up and that's teaching something different from the gospel, but this desire to be part of the, the few, the spiritually elite, as it were, kind of can bewitch somebody or lead them astray. This is exactly what Paul says is happening with these believers. He says, listen, you, you started by the Spirit. You've truly been born again. You began your journey with Jesus, not by law keeping, but by the Spirit. But now you're trying to live out your faith by the flesh and by the power of your own effort. So Paul asked them, did you receive the Spirit of God? Did you see the power of God's Spirit? Did you see the working of miracles to the Spirit of God because you followed the law or because you believed in Jesus? Now, apparently the churches in Galatia had seen mighty workings of miracles in their midst. And Paul says, are miracles things that you earn or are miracles gifts of God's grace? Listen, as a pastor of the past 10 years, I have seen God do some amazing miracles. Remember being in Uganda with another pastor and we're doing evangelism and we're walking around a village and there was a woman that said, does this Jesus that you preach about, can he make me walk? I've not walked in 10 years. And the other pastor said, well, I don't know. Let's ask him. So he prayed for her and she got up and walked. Let me ask you a question. Did that woman earn that miracle? What if I told you she was Muslim and God still touched her and healed her? And that miracle led her to faith in Christ, but she didn't earn that miracle. This is exactly what Paul's talking about. You know, the greatest miracle of all is being born again. And you can't earn that miracle. It's a gift of God's grace. And this is what Paul is getting us to see. Miracles aren't things you earn. The power and the working of the Spirit, that's not something you earn. That's a gift of the grace of God. And then Paul starts to reason with them. He says, okay, you want to talk about the Jewish faith and the purity of the Jewish faith? Let's go back to the beginning. You remember Abraham, the founder of the Jewish faith, the father of the Jewish faith? How was Abraham made right with God? Paul begins to quote Genesis 15, 6, where it says that Abram believed God and God counted him as righteous. Before he was circumcised, before he had any law to follow, Abram was still counted as righteous before God. Now, how does that work? Well, if you remember, before Abraham was Abraham, he was Abram. That's a name that means exalted father. That's kind of an unfortunate name when you consider Abram's condition in life. He has no children at the age of 86, and his name means exalted father. That's like an Indian whose name is running gazelle, and he has no legs, right? I mean, that's kind of a weird name to have. His wife is barren. He's really old. God shows up and says, I'm going to make you, the guy who has no kids at 86 with a barren wife, the father of a mighty, mighty nation. And Abram's probably thinking, how is that going to work, right? I mean, I don't know how this is supposed to work. I don't... But what does Abram do? Well, God makes him a promise. It's an audacious promise. It's a crazy promise. It's a promise that he's probably thinking, I don't know how this is supposed to work. But Abram believes the promise of God. And the word for believe in Hebrew is where we get the word amen. Quite literally, Abram, here's the promise of God. You know what he does? He says, amen. Amen. I received that. I believe it. Yes. Amen. And because Abram trusted God and said yes to God and believed God, God counted it to him as righteousness. He credited it to his account as righteousness. Abram didn't do any work to be declared righteous before God. He simply said amen to, and he trusted God, and God took his own righteousness and put it on Abram's account. And then we see that Abram's given a child of promise and his name becomes Abraham, which means father of the multitude or father of many. And so Paul asked the question, okay, so who then are the true sons of Abraham? Those who keep the law? Well, no, those who have faith just as Abraham had faith. And the offer to be a part of Abraham's family, that's not just for the Jewish people, that's extended to all the nations. Anybody from any tribe, any ethnic group, Jew or Gentile, who places their faith in God and says amen to the promise of salvation through Jesus the Messiah can become a son or a daughter of Abraham. But the blessing of God belongs to those who have the same faith as Abraham. Those who would hear the promise of God, who would say amen to the promise of God, and who would believe those are the true children of Abraham. Are you still with me? Two of you. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Look at verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. 
Now it's clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. Paul says something very, very interesting in verse 10. He says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Sometimes as I share my faith with people from uh, rural middle Tennessee or just middle Tennessee in general, I encounter people who have just enough religion to make them dangerous. And here's how they play their hand and show me they have just enough religion to make them dangerous. They know enough of the commands of God and the law of God, but they have a mistaken view of the commands and law of God in that they see the law and commands of God like bowling pins that they knock down one at a time. They'll say, well, you know, I didn't bowl a strike, but I got like a seven or eight, and that's pretty good. That's still a passing score, isn't it? Because, I mean, I'm not perfect, right? I mean, there's some people that, you know, were better than me, but I've not murdered anybody. I've not killed anybody. I've not cheated on my spouse. But, I mean, I, you know, I still have some hatred in my heart, and I lie every now and again, but that's not that big of a deal. And so when we have just enough religion to make us dangerous, here's what happens. We think our obedience in certain areas makes up for our disobedience in other areas. And then we judge our own morality on the basis of comparison. Are you following me with this? And so we, we will look at certain sins that we have in our life and we'll see them as baby decaf sins, right? Just tiny little sins, right? And then the sins of others and whoa, that's a huge sin, right? My sin, not that bad. Other people's sin, that's, that's really, really bad. And, and we rely on the works of the law for saying, well, because I'm a good person, I'm trying my hardest, God's gonna let me in when I die. And because I try really hard and I follow most of them, then that means that I'm actually quite better than most people who don't follow them. But what you're showing is you actually don't understand the law and you're relying on works of the law and you're under a curse. And some very religious people, not just nominally religious people, some very religious people actually do this too. In some of the traditions I grew up in, uh, we were told this law, thou shalt not smoke. <laughs> and, and here was the verse that was used to, to show this law. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. How many know that's true? That's true. The book of 1 Corinthians tells us that, so we should honor God with our bodies. But if we're going to actually use that principle to say that we shouldn't smoke, we got to be consistent with how we apply that principle. And so it's interesting to me that so many of the religious people I met that said, you shouldn't smoke because your body is a temple, I would look and say, it doesn't seem like you're consistently applying that law to the other areas of your life because we're not saying anything about gluttony and overeating. So, so what does that show? And I'm not trying to be salty or mean this one. I'm just showing. If you want to play this game, you got to keep every law. You got to keep every single law. If you rely on the works of the law to be saved, if you rely on the works of the law to try to gain God's approval or feel spiritually superior to other people, you've got to keep every one of the works of the law. Not just the ones that are easy for you to do. Spoiler alert, you can't. You can't. Welcome to humanity. We cannot keep the law. And Paul says, it is clear that no one is justified before God by the works of the law. Like just a cursory reading of the Old Testament. And you read some of the stories about those who were considered heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. It's pretty obvious that they didn't keep the law perfectly. And the Bible still sees them as heroes of the faith. I mean, if you read Hebrews 11, the hall of faith passage, all these heroes of the Jewish faith, Noah and Moses and Jacob and David. And we look at their lives and we go, wow, these are men and women of faith. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, every one of those brothers and sisters are basket cases, right? Jacob's a liar and a deceiver. Noah, we commend him for his faithfulness in building the ark. But after he gets off the ark, he plants a vineyard, makes wine, gets drunk and passes out naked in front of his sons. Some of you are like, what? That's in the Bible, right? I mean, don't get me started about David. He's an adulterer. He's a murderer. I mean, Moses, apparently, he's got an anger problem. He kills a guy, tries to bury him in the sand. That doesn't work too well, right? 
I mean, we see all of these men and women through the Old Testament. We say, man, how are they made right with God? Is it because they were able to keep the law perfectly? No, because you can't. The principle given in the Old and New Testament is this. The righteous will live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2.4. That the righteousness of God is provided for people who would have enough humility to admit, I have no righteousness of my own, and it's provided for them through their faith in Jesus Christ. But if you rely on the law and you try to live by the law, live by your rule keeping to try to earn salvation or try to earn God's approval or try to prove that you're a good person, that's not faith at all. That's bondage. That's not freedom. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is that Jesus came to rescue us from that curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. In that, he stood in our place and he took the curse that we deserve because of our law-breaking and our sin. And Paul says that he redeemed us from the curse of the law. That word redeem means he literally bought us out of our slavery to the curse of the law. And what was the price that he paid? The price of his own life. That Jesus willingly made himself the target of every curse that our sin rightly Deserved. If you're struggling to understand what Paul is saying, let me just break it down for you. Paul says it's, it's like that Old Testament principle in the book of Deuteronomy where anyone who hung on a tree was cursed. Jesus was cursed because he hung on a tree because he died on the cross. Now, what is he quoting? Well, Deuteronomy 21, 23, God had said to Israel, any human body that after death gets desecrated by being hung on a tree, that's a defilement. That's a shameful thing. That person is cursed by God. Now, how did Jesus die for your sins and mine? He was hung on a Roman cross. Why? So that he could absorb and receive the curse of your sin and mine because you're not able to keep the law upon himself by going to that cross. That the curse of the law has been paid in full by Jesus' sacrificial death on your behalf that Jesus got the curse so that through him, we could get the blessing of Abraham. And what's the blessing of Abraham? The blessing of Abraham is the blessing of being able to be made right with God by faith instead of by works. What a blessing. What a blessing. Because if, man, if, if the Christian faith is all about just rules and just try hard to keep the rules, we all know if we just have a little bit of self-awareness that we can't do it, but the blessing of Abraham is, man, we get to look at the promise of God that he's going to call us forgiven and pure because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And God says that person's righteous. What a blessing. And with that blessing is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not earned. The Holy Spirit is received by faith. And what Paul says is this is a promise to anyone, Jew or Gentile, any tribe, tongue, nation, anybody that puts their faith in Christ. Let's look at this next part. Look at verse 15. We'll read from verse 15 to verse 22. Brothers and sisters, I'm using a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to a validated human will. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, who is Christ. My point is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously established by God and thus cancel the promise. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise. But God has graciously given it to Abraham through the promise. Why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Now, Paul begins this section talking about a, a human illustration. He says, when somebody makes a binding agreement, some translations say that's a covenant or a, a validated human will, but it's just a, a binding agreement. Um, you, you don't just arbitrarily go back and change that promise later. That's not how it works. 
that covenant, that legally validated human will, that's, that's like binding. It stands and nobody can just set it aside. Nobody can make any additions to it. And what Paul says is, listen, if this is how human covenants are made, if this is how they work, if this is how they operate, how much more certain is a promise, is a covenant that Almighty God makes? Almighty God, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's not a man that he should lie or change his mind. He's going to keep his promises, right? So God made a promise to Abraham and to his seed. And Paul says, seed is singular, not plural. He's quoting Genesis 22, 18, where God told Abraham that in your seed, again, singular, not plural, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then Paul says, who was that promised seed? That promised seed was Jesus. He's the seed of Abraham. Uh, some of you started your Bible reading plan this year. You're really excited about it. You're going to read through the New Testament in a year or the Bible in a year. And you turned to Matthew chapter one on January 1st. And you had your coffee and you sat down and Matthew says, and so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And you went, ah, right? Well, why does Matthew begin his gospel that way? Well, Matthew's gospel is written primarily to a Jewish audience. And so Matthew begins his gospel with the lineage of Jesus. And where he begins that lineage is with none other than Abraham to prove that Jesus is the promised prophesied seed of Abraham. Now to a Jewish reader, this would have made so much sense. And this would have been mind blowing, but, but to us, what, what's Paul's point? Like what exactly is he trying to get us to see? Here's what he's getting us to see. Faith in God's covenant that he first gave to Abraham, that takes priority over the law. Why? Because it came first. The promise that God gave to Abraham that all the nations of the world would be blessed through his seed happened 430 years before the law was given to Israel. So if Abraham was justified in the sight of God simply because he believed the promise of God, how can you go back and say, no, it's actually the law that justifies, it's actually the law that saves? Paul says that's ridiculous. It doesn't invalidate the covenant and the promise of God. It doesn't cancel the promise of God. It doesn't change the covenant of God. But this promise that God gave to Abraham, that wasn't based on Abraham's ability to keep the law, but simply on God's promise of what he would do. Now, if you've read anything about the life of Abraham, you can attest to that guy wasn't perfect either. There's that weird story of Abraham lying and saying that his wife was actually his sister, Gross, right? So he could like not have his wife. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? Yeah, you need to be reading it. Uh, so Abraham's not perfect, but here, here's what we see. The book of James says we see the works of Abraham working in tandem with his faith. In other words, there's proof that Abraham actually believed God. How do we know that Abraham actually believed God? Listen very carefully. He obeyed God. He obeyed God. So how do you know if you actually have faith that works? If you obey God. If you do something when God says you need to do it. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but what it does mean is that the trajectory, of life, the trajectory of your life is one of commitment and it's one of loyalty to God. So what's the whole point of the law then? If the law is not something that we can live up to, we can't be saved by the law, why would God give the law and the commandments to Israel? Why would he even bother? Well, Paul is so glad you're asking these questions. <laughs> He tells us in verse 19, the law was added for the sake of transgressions. In other words, the law was given to demonstrate our complete, total, and absolute spiritual bankruptcy, our total sinfulness. I've been told in certain posh and snooty circles in England, when you go to a really, really fancy cricket match and somebody steps out of bounds, instead of saying out of bounds, they say transgression, <laughs> Because that's exactly what that word means. It means to step out of bounds. That the law of God laid down a perfect boundary for God's righteous requirements for living. That this is right, that this is wrong. This is what a life committed to God looks like. And this is what an immoral, wicked life looks like. And the law sets that boundary. But you know what else the law shows? There's never been a single human being anywhere on planet earth who's been able to stay within that perfect boundary. You can't do it. I can't do it. We are all sinners in need of a savior. That the law was meant, the law was given to reveal our transgressions. 
and to show our need for salvation until the seed, that is the Messiah, Jesus, came to save us. Paul also says that the law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. What is he talking about? Well, Jewish tradition stated that when the law was given to Moses at Sinai, it was actually given to Moses via angels who acted kind of as an intermediary between Moses and God. But what Paul gets us to see is when God made a promise to Abraham and his descendants, God did it directly. He didn't use a middleman. He didn't use a mediator. That Moses needed a mediator between himself and God, apparently, but we don't need a mediator between us and Jesus because Jesus is our mediator. And that's really good news. So is there some sort of a conflict between the law of God, that the law of God is bad and that the promises of God, that's good. And Paul knew you were going to ask that question too. And he says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. The law is good. The law is holy. The law is perfect. God gave the law for a reason. It's just that the law can never do what only Jesus can do. The law wasn't given to give life. It can't give life. The law wasn't given to give you a right standing with God. It can't give you a right standing with God. Its purpose is to reveal that everything has been imprisoned by sin under the judgment of God, therefore in need of forgiveness from God, redemption from God, and release from the penalty of the law. How many of you know we live in a world that is absolutely marked by deceptiveness, deceit, and lies? There's a lot of liars in the world. How would we know what a lie is unless we had some standard for what lying and truth actually looks like? How many of you know we live in a world that's marked by sexual perversion? How would we know what sexual perversion is unless there's some sort of a standard for what God's design for human sexuality even looks like? But here's the problem. Uh, many of us, we amen, and yes, absolutely, yes, I know the law says sexual perversion. But like some of us, you, you amen me and say, yeah, I know what the law is, but deep down you know I can't actually keep that and follow that. You know why? Because the law doesn't give you the power to follow it. It just reveals that you can't do it on your own. And what the law does is it points you to Christ. And Paul's going to conclude this section in chapter 3 with just an absolutely brilliant conclusion. Look at verse 23. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian some translations say tutor. We'll talk about that word here in a minute. Until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So what Paul says is this, before Christ came to offer salvation through faith in his completed work, humanity was imprisoned. Humanity was in some sort of spiritual protective custody. He says it's like this. He says humanity was like a child who was being watched over and guided by a tutor or a guardian. But he uses a very interesting word. He uses the word pedagogos. If you went to college and you studied uh, classes in education, maybe you took a pedagogy class. Maybe I take a pedagogy class. That's where we get that word from. And a pedagogos in a Roman family was a tutor or a guardian that had charge over the life and morals of the boys in a Roman family. That the pedagogos would follow these boys around and keep them in line. Um, my first career job when I was 21 years old is I taught seventh grade for two years, and I spent all day every day with 12 and 13-year-old boys. I thought I was going into education to teach prepositional phrases in literature. I really taught two lessons every day over and over again. Keep your hands to yourself and stop talking. That's all I taught, right? And I would say those two lessons over and over again a million different ways. And I come up at the end of the day exhausted going, man, how many times do I have to say this before these kids know to keep their hands to themselves and stop talking, right? Because I don't know, if you've spent any time around seventh grade boys, I don't know if you know this, they like need a, a lot of boundaries. They, they need a lot of reminders. They need a lot of somebody just like keeping them in line, right? 
Some of you are amen in me way too hard. I see in the back going, oh. <laughs> right? And, and what Paul says is this, that, that's kind of like what the law does before you come to faith in Christ. Whether it's the written law of scripture, whether it's the inward law of your conscience, the law follows you around like some sort of a schoolmaster, giving you this basic sense of morality, giving you this basic sense of what is right, what is wrong, telling you when you step over the line, you stepped over that line, you shouldn't have done that. And we kind of feel it in our conscience like some shrill schoolmaster with a switch beating us on the hand and going, ah, I shouldn't have done that. But you know what else the law does? It reveals to us that we're incapable in our own strength of always perfectly following the rules. It can tell you what you did wrong. It can show you how you're not living the way you need to live. It can sometimes guide you to do certain good things, but ultimately it reveals to you you're not capable of fully keeping it all the time. But you know, the whole point of the, the pedagogos in a Roman family is that the pedagogos would help the child grow up in maturity that eventually that child's brain would develop and that child would learn things like impulse control, right? <laughs> Which, Because I don't know if you know this, the, the human brain doesn't stop developing until the age 25. So if you're 17 and you think you're a genius and your parents are idiots, let me just remind you, your brain's not finished developing, right? <laughs> There's come, come a day when you think mom and dad are actually not dummies anymore. It's an amazing day, right? And so when you grow up as a child, you start to understand that like, being a mature adult looks a lot different than how it looked when you were 12 and 13. And Paul says that's kind of what it's like. The whole point of the law is to help us grow. And as we grow up in spiritual maturity, we realize three things. Number one, the holiness of God is way up here and it's a standard that is higher than I ever imagined it would be. Number two, I'm not able to live up to that standard because I have sin in my life. And number three, I need Jesus. And that's what spiritual maturity is, those three things. God has a holy standard, I'm not able to live up to it, and I need Jesus. And then we step into faith in Christ. In a Roman family, when a young man became a young man, became an heir of the house, he didn't have a tutor following him around anymore, he was given a toga that symbolized he was an adult man. And Paul uses that language and he says, you've been clothed with Christ. That when faith shows up, that's when you know that you are mature in your spirituality, the relationship changes. It is now no longer the, the law following you around like a shrill schoolmaster correcting you. Now you have faith in Christ and you are now a son of God in Christ Jesus. And you enter into this new relationship through faith in Christ. You're born again into the very family of God and you now have the privilege of knowing God as a father. Listen to me. Knowing God as a father is revolutionary. It's revolutionary. You know why? Because your faith becomes less about this set of rules to try to follow so you can avoid punishment and seek reward. And it's more about trusting, loving obedience to your father that you love and that you know personally. And you want to obey him. You know why? Because you trust him. You trust him. Even when he says some things to you that don't make sense, you go, all right, you said it. I believe it. That settles it. Amen. <laughs> and you follow and you obey and you trust. And then Paul says, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. Now, Paul is a big fan of water baptism. He writes about it in many places. But most scholars think that Paul is not really talking about water baptism in this verse. He's, being ta he's, he's talking about a different kind of baptism. He said, if any, those of you who have been baptized into Christ, the word he uses is the word baptizo, and it's been translated in many different ways, but quite literally it means to be sunk, submerged, dipped, or covered. And so what he's saying is, if you've been baptized into Christ, you have been sunk, submerged, dipped, and covered into the very person of Jesus Christ by your faith. This corresponds with what he said in chapter 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I'm, I'm buried at Christ. I'm sunk into Christ. You don't see me anymore. You know who you see? You see Jesus. That's all you see. That if we've put faith in Christ, we're invited into this life where we are sunk, we are submerged, we are dipped, we are covered by Christ, and we put on his identity like clothing, like a garment. And then he says, if that's true, 
If you've put your faith in Christ, you've been sunk, submerged, dipped, covered in Christ, you've put him on like clothing, then there is equal standing that we have with one another within the body of Christ. There is therefore now no Jew or Greek. To those within this church who were feeling spiritually superior because they were Jewish and these other people weren't, he says, ethnic identities and religious pedigrees, that doesn't earn you anything in the eyes of God. He says, now there is no slave or free. Uh, Slavery in the Roman Empire had less to do with racial slavery and more to do with social or economic class. But what Paul says is radical, economic or social class, that doesn't mean anything in Christ's body. Man, you you may feel like hot snot because you have a seven-figure income. Whoop-de-doo. You know, in the body of Christ, that doesn't really matter. Now, in the world, that matters a lot, doesn't it? You feel like you're better than people because you make a lot of money? Well, in the body of Christ, that doesn't matter as much as you think it does. You are still equal with that person next to you that makes minimum wage or even unemployed. Then he says, there's no male or female. Now, it's not that God completely scrubs away your sexual identity. It is that men don't have a spiritual advantage over women in the body of Christ. Anytime people say, well, Christianity is (laughs) anti-woman. Christianity was the most radical pro-woman movement in the first century. And, and women don't have a spiritual advantage over men either. What Paul is saying is revolutionary. And it's this, regardless of your race, regardless of your profession, regardless of your socioeconomic status, regardless of your gender, anyone who comes to Christ must come the exact same way. And that is through repentance and that is through faith. And when we do, here's what we find. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There, there's no room for you to spill spirit feel spiritually inferior or for you to feel spiritually superior because what matters is that you're clothed with Christ that we're one in Christ Jesus if you belong to Christ it doesn't matter your background your ethnicity your social standing you're invited to be a part of God's spiritual family isn't that beautiful but I just want to say something to you that you probably already know this is a very countercultural message Because it's a message that speaks of unity. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but we're not exactly keen on unity these days. I thought it was just me and my suspicions. Then I read an article from the LA Times this past week where it documented some research done by the Pew Research Forum. And there were 17 countries surveyed in Europe, Asia, North America. And in those 17 countries, Americans were by far found to be the most divided. And here's what we do as Americans. We are split along political lines, racial lines, ideological lines, social lines, and ethnic lines. Not only are we split, we're obsessed with labels. Have you noticed that? Well, what are you? Well, I'm a conservative. Okay, what kind of conservative? How far right are you conservative? You conservative here or you a rhino? Republican by name only, right? Like, are you you part of my tribe or that other tribe? Because if you're my tribe, come on in. You're one of us, as long as you think exactly like us and you don't think for yourself. But if you're part of the other tribe, we'll hate you because that's what we do in my tribe, right? Can I ask you a question? Why is it that we do this? You know what I think it is? There is a longing in every human heart to belong to something bigger than themselves. We want to belong We want to feel a part of something. We want to feel included. And so what we do is we put labels and we invite people to be a part of our tribe and we give ourselves labels. And all that leads to is more hatred, more fear, and more division in our world. And in the midst of all of this, the gospel of Jesus shows up and the gospel of Jesus shatters all of that with the most unifying, hopeful message there is. And that message is if you put your hope and trust and faith in Christ, you're a part of a family that transcends all that. And that's amazing, and that's beautiful, and that's freeing. But the question is this, are we able to see past the cultural labels? Are we able to recognize other people as human beings for, for whom Christ died? When you see another person, what do you see first? Their skin color? What do you see first? Their voting preference? What do you see first? No, they think differently than I do. They, they behave differently than I do. They speak a different language than I do. You know that doesn't matter as much as you think it does? You know what matters more than any of that? If they belong to Christ. That doesn't just matter for other people that you see. That matters for how you identify yourself. 
Look, the text isn't saying that your biological sex doesn't matter. God made us male and female, and there's a beautiful design to all of that. Uh, the Bible isn't saying your ethnicity doesn't matter either. In the book of Revelation, before the throne of the Lamb, it says they will bring in the wealth of nations before the throne of the Lamb. I, I, I think what that means, and I could be wrong, but I think what that means is we're going to see the beauty and diversity of the cultures and ethnicities of the world in the New Jerusalem. Man, I'm going to be hanging out in the Mexican section eating all their food every single day. Right? <laughs> Comes to worshiping, I mean, the African section and, you know, over here in the I think ethnicity is beautiful. I think culture is beautiful. Uh, it doesn't mean your profession doesn't matter. God's given you personality and skill sets and, and he's given you giftings. And those things matter a lot. But, but really what the word is saying is it's not those things that earn you some sort of special status in the eyes of God. And those things are not your primary identifier. Those things are not your core identity. If I were to ask you, tell me about yourself, and you were to say about yourself, well, first and foremost, um, you know, I'm, I'm a firefighter, and I'm a conservative, and I'm a, uh, a white middle class, uh, and, and oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. No, you're not. If you've been baptized into Christ, you've been submerged, you've been sunk, you've been covered, you've been hidden in Christ. Christ is your identity. Paul said it this way in Philippians, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if you belong to Christ, that's what's most important. But think about that statement for a minute. Belonging to Christ implies ownership, intimacy, exclusivity, commitment. I, I wear this wedding band on my finger to say that I belong to Jenny Brooker. So back off, ladies, right? <laughs> It hurts me you're laughing like that. All the women, every time I say that, just go as if, right? <laughs> yeah, so like that means that um, there's exclusivity there. There's commitment there. But there's a relationship there. Do you see that? I ask you a question. Is your relationship with Jesus defined in those terms? Mutual, exclusive, committed? It's intimate that there's actually a relationship that you know him personally. It's not just a set of rules or a set of ideas. It's a personal relationship because that's what you've been invited to. Personal relationship, not just with Jesus, your savior, but a personal relationship with God as your father. It was the Christian apologist, Josh McDowell, that made this observation about teenagers. He said this, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. And can I tell you, as a former high school teacher, how true this is? If you run your home with an iron fist and you keep those kids in line, but you don't nurture that relationship, you'll lose them 10 times out of 10. I've seen it again and again and again and again, that rules without relationship leads to rebellion. If that's true in the earthly biological family, how much more true is that when it comes to your faith? Because when we see this is just about rules to follow instead of a loving, perfect father to know, love, and trust through obedience, we shouldn't be all that surprised when over time our heart starts to become hardened through rebellion. Why? Because rules without relationship leads to rebellion. But what you've been invited into by Jesus is to be a part of God's family that God is now your father and he sees you now as a son or as a daughter. And he said, hey, come follow me. Come be part of my family. Receive my love. Let's live out this purpose. And, and even if you don't understand exactly what he's doing, you can look at him like Abram did to God and say, yes, amen. I receive and believe that. I'll go where it is you tell me to go. Why? Because I trust you. I don't know where you're asking me to go, but I know where you're asking me to go is good. You know why? Because you're good and I can obey you. The question that matters as we close this morning is, have you received this love? Truly, genuinely. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and bow your head.